because of the pressure of time, I think what we'll do is we'll just combine our session and then you can help me give my final speech since sure. we sort of agree on everything, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do. You see? Sure. Let's start with... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> let's start with... What I like about Ivan is he's a very straightforward guy. He started off as a, literally a lineman, a, a splicer, right. um, and has risen to run one of the most important companies in the world and certainly a company that is crucial to everything we're trying to achieve. And I think it'd be interesting to tell first a little bit how, how I met Ivan. Ivan decided to visit Google. And he just shows up by himself, wandering through the building, right? Interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, this is interesting. A very curious man. And at the time, there was tremendous tension between my side of the world and the telcos. And we, were, we had a nice meeting. We were fairly, I was fairly skeptical of some of the things that he said, and especially about openness and so forth. And then uh, a set of his executives, including Lowell McAdam, actually decided to announce commitments to openness. And I said, like, this is not really going to happen, is it? And they did, and they delivered. Uh, and then a while later, it turns out that they got very interested in Android. And they said, you know, not only are we going to adopt Android, but we're going to put a lot of marketing money behind it. And I said, eh, we'll see. I finally now believe the central essence of Verizon is that they actually do what, they're going to, what they say they're going to do, which I suspect is your leadership style. Well, thank you. No, we try. When, uh, for, to start with, can you talk a little bit about just what is the scale of Verizon? Right? How many people? What's the revenue? Where does the revenue come from? You know, th th there's a stereotype that somehow all of your revenue comes from the old business, not the new business. So what if this is true? What's false? Okay, so the quick elevator speeches were $110 billion. Um, about 80 is wireless. About um, 15 or 20 is the former MCI that we acquired. So in uh, hindsight, the old telco that you all maybe remember is 10 or 15% of the whole it's company. It's that small. Yeah. And I assume it's getting right. smaller. Yeah, it mm -hmm. represents a bigger part of our cost structure, but in terms of revenue, it's... Uh, so it's you have high there. cost, declining revenue there. Right. Exactly. So don't you have a problem getting, dealing with all those people and trying to get them over? Yeah, so we're 220,000 people. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? 220,000. 220,000 employees. Right. And they were formed, of course, from the union of all these RBOCs. Correct. And those of you who are not familiar with the storied history of the telcos, um, all of these executives worked for AT&T. Then Judge Green b uh, broke up AT&T into seven Arbucks uh, and left AT&T around. Eventually, the Arbucks swallowed up each other, leaving two largely successor ones. And one of them sw swallowed up AT&T and renamed itself. Is that a rough summary of your history? That's good. I, I think that for this audience, though, there's one or two little facts that you might be interested in. Probably 50% of our company were, has worked for us for less than seven years. So we're basically a new business. So we have. We're a legacy corporate structure. Uh, we've renamed ourselves 10 years ago, but uh, I think the issue we have, a, a very new workforce. Mm -hmm. And um, probably 60 to 70% of all our revenues have been generated in the last three or four years. Wireless was zero revenues um, 20 years ago. In, in 2001, it was about eight or nine billion, and now it's 80. So, we consider ourselves much more of a, a new age business than probably people categorize us. And I'm shocked because this next generation doesn't seem to have home phones. They seem to actually just have cell phones. 25% of people cut the cord on their, their, on yeah, their home phone. It's an amazing line. statistic. Right. How many of those people are now moving to what we would think of as smartphones and powerful wireless data plans and so forth? Well, if you look at smartphones uh, right now, 60% of every sale, all the sales we make today are smartphones. If you look at our base, we're about 20, a little over 20% of our base is smartphones. AT&T's base, about 40% of their base is uh, smartphones because of the, their iPhone uh, success. So the issue is, our view, 70% of people will have a, a smartphone within three or four years. So it's very soon. Right. Um, why did you make the decision to become open, open standards, all of that, when nobody else did? You asked me. Well, that's yeah. very kind of you. I suspect there were good reasons as well. What, the real reason? Yes, the real reason. No, it's very simple. I think when you, our job is to find growth. Okay. And so when you think about growth, you know, we inject a lot of our uh, capital into building networks that have more reach, more bandwidth, more scope, more functionality. And um, I think you globalize and openness creates growth. So I, I think that, you know, that people tend to look at existing institutions as if uh, openness becomes a, a sort of a, um, uh, a detractor to generating growth, but it's just the opposite. 
And so the, as the system gets bigger, as software develops, as applications develops, as the consumer changes, the only way you can sort of keep yourself growing with the market is you've got to change some things. So for us, it's investment in, in three things. It's investment in our core network, because at heart, we're all we're kind of sort of engineers. We like to be engineers. Uh, the second is our brand. We spend a lot of money on our brand. And the third thing is our distribution. So like, we're one of the, the few, stores. Maybe. Yeah, right. We're one of the few companies that actually owns all our stores. Mm -hmm. So we pride ourselves on having 2,200 stores. And, and uh, if you go into our stores, there's an experience that goes with that. So those three things. And then, uh, Eric, what you do is you take with that the mentality of openness, machine to machine connections, you know, component parts to component parts. Um, and you know all the rest. Everybody here understands that. But services and applications, um, you win, we win. So, uh, so, so the only time I've ever seen you get mad is when I mentioned Title I regulation. You, don't want, you want me to get mad now? I it? just want you to explain what it means and why. You said it was a nuclear issue. Well, you it, use stronger words than that. Yeah, no, in a nutshell, here's the kind of way we see it. So I mean, you've been regulated. Well, but you know, we have spent close to $100 billion of, of investor capital to change our company. And yet we have people in Washington that want to hold on to us as if we look the same as we did 25 years ago. Um, th to some of that, we thought Google felt that way about us. And, and so we, we used to have very heated discussions. But it's pretty simple to us. Um, we are completely on the side of the public internet should be open. We've never behaved any differently. We've never viewed the issue any differently than that. But, but for us to invest money into 4G networks and 5G networks, for us to invest in fiber optics to, to the home, there has to be a component of that network that is open to innovation, that where you can create different packages. And, and, and you're concerned that the right. FCC now is going to regulate? Well, the, the FCC, just to, to put it put into effect, would take uh, Title II is their label for old-style utility regulation. So what they wanted to do is because they lost the case on the BitTorrent with um, uh, Comcast. You're all familiar with that? I assume you are. Okay, so what, what happened there very quickly is that Comcast sort of slowed down the bits because they didn't have enough capacity, and that turned out to be a big thing, and the FCC uh, tried to sue them, and they lost in court because they didn't have jurisdiction. So the solution to that was to drag everybody into an old-style regulation. Our view is when you do that, risk capital goes someplace else, you end up with rules you don't need, and you basically create a situation where you try to take a network asset like ours, an infrastructure piece, and turn it into a public asset or a public utility. And what will happen is what happens in every other country in the world when the government runs the postal office or runs the telecommunication system, you're always going to be behind the curve. So the bottom line is we've said, where you need enforcement, you need rules, we're there. We don't want people managing our risk capital. So w changing subject for a sec, most people believe your network is the fastest, at least the, certainly the broadest fastest in America. Um, you've certainly not had the problems that AT&T has had on your network, mm -hmm. and you have 4G LTE coming. Right. So take us through that. Uh, my understanding is that that is an immense amount of capital, which is at, very much at risk. Right. right. You're depending upon applications. When does it come out? What are, wh how yeah. committed are you to this? How fundamental is it? Mm. Okay. So, so here's the story. So really quickly, so you get a sense of sort of mindset. So 10 years ago, Everybody said the network is a commodity. Anybody can build a network. We don't believe that. So the first execution of what we try to do different was, can you hear me now? Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody remembers that. It was our way of saying, wait, the network is not a commodity. Yeah. So we then went from 1G to 2G to 3G. Every time you go from one generation to the next, you get better compression. You basically increase speeds by about 30 35%. So here we are with the 3G network, um, nationwide 3G network, CDMA-based, as, as you know. Um, you're getting one and a half megabits, 1.8 megabits per second. And then the 4G technology comes along, it's eight to 10 megabits per second. So here we are saying, with eight to 10 megabits per second, we can transmit high definition video. So we made a decision, we would stop building out our 3G network and convert all of that capital to 4G. We were criticized for that because 
the device manufacturers, the whole system was geared to, toward GSM, the European standard, and it was geared to a 3G model. So we had to get out in front of the market by saying we would build a 4G network, and we needed to find a couple of partners that would take a risk with us. This is where Eric and Google were very visionary about this. They didn't sort of agree with our business plan, but they said, if this works, this is a way for Google to jumpstart. Because remember, to be honest about it, Apple owned the smartphone market. AT&T did an exclusive deal. We held our own all this time, but now 4G changes the game. And, and define 4G for this audience again. 4G is just a sort of a, a, a carrier's model. It's a fourth generation. It's, just, it's, a, it's an overlay network on top of the existing tower structures. So everything still works. Everything still works. Everything's backward compatible. So uh, when, you, when we cut over 4G, if you buy a new 4G device, it'll be backward compatible with, with uh, the existing network. Now, from an infrastructure guy, here's um, some interesting tidbits. So the speed is almost eight times 3G in, on a throughput, average throughput basis. Latency is four times what it is on 3G, meaning delay is four times better. Cost is four to six times better for us. We could not figure out why everybody didn't do this. Mm -hmm. And what happened was we announced, everybody said, it's not gonna work, it's gonna take too long to do it. Everybody's now announced. Okay. So we'll be in the market. So where we are, Eric, is, um, um, if you can keep a secret, I'll tell you the dates, you know, so um, somehow in uh, the fourth quarter of this year, our network is already up and working. It's working at 100 uh, million population locations, 32 major markets, 50 or so major airports around the country. It's working right now. We're doing all of the testing, the protocol. Um, when we cut over a network, we don't cut over one tower and say we're in business. We wait until- Are you telling me that it's already there and you just haven't turned it on? Yeah, you gotta get rid of that Blackberry you're using because you'd find out how much good, how much better <laughs> this is. But, but the issue is, it's working. So what will happen is when we announce um, it's up and running, that's when people will be able to buy 4G devices. Okay, and so the first set of things that will come out, we hope will be some tablets. And you've probably heard from Sanjay and some others, there, there are some companies that are focusing on 4G tablets amazingly robust and interesting. So this is a device. tablet that's got 10 megabits going to it. It's with got video and the, everything. It's got a lot of stuff. I mean, I carry a tablet in my bag and it's got some amazing things on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, a lot, and there's lots of applications. It's not just entertainment. It's just so many interesting things. Then the other thing is there'll be some um, air cards. Obviously, people will use that for their, their applications. And what we'll start to see are devices being rolled out. So you'll, you'll see a, a slow build up. The time you get to the end of the first quarter, the middle of the next year, you'll start to see a choice of devices. And then all the carriers will start to uh, move. And then what we hope will be is that the world will move to the 4G standard. Why is this important to us? You know, 70% of the world is on GSM. So we have done as well as we're gonna do with our wireless business. So growth said we wanted to reach the whole world. And so we had to move to a global standard, which is now 4G. And you know, one of the things behind the scenes, Eric, that we've always worked on is, like you do this, our, our people didn't just roll out 4G, but we worked hard at all the standards bodies to make sure that we had consistency so, across so, the So basically, world. at the end of this year, we're gonna have a network which is eight times faster, four times better latency, and costs you less to run and build. Right. Sounds like a pretty good deal to You me. might have to move to one of those 32 cities, but the other cities- Well, like there. which, like what's the list of cities? Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you that if you want, but you can figure it out. But no, let me just talk about that, so- Well, let's start with New York, San Francisco, LA. Yeah, right, you, you can figure those out. But here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> but, but here's where we are, though. So we cut over 32, and then the day we cut over, 24 months later, we're 90% of the country. Okay. So we will deploy Every month, there will be a cutover someplace in the country. In that right. sub sub subsequent. So in the space of 34 months, we will be 94 or 5 percent deployed before G around the country. So yes. we think that's a huge deal. So for all of you who sort of work with Google, write applications, um, got to think differently about the kind of applications and consumer demand that will take advantage of what this kind of capability offers. I want to come back to that in a sec. Um, let me ask you my last question. Because we're compressing things, what I'm not going to do is also give my comments, uh, and Ivan, again, can help a little bit. But I have one final question for you. Um, 
you're quite on the record about your view of this administration and their business policies. Um, I think people would be interested in your criticisms and what you would do differently. Uh, my observation is that the government is now stuck until January, so it doesn't matter what you and I say, because nothing's going to happen. What do you really think is going on? Well, look, I, I, for those of you who don't know, I, I serve as the chairman of the Business Roundtable. So the Business Which Roundtable. Which is the biggest collection of uh, business executives. Right. So it's a, it's a CEO principled only organization, so 200 companies. So, so um, I get more probably visibility than I, I should get with, with that. So everything I say carries with it um, dual uh, capabilities on this. But here's what I would say. I think that the issue to us in the business community is the, is the administration, it's not the president, it's the entire government's ability to operationalize the ideas that were the foundation of this president getting elected and converting them into things that need to work every day. So it's not a disagreement that we want to spread the wealth. It's not a disagreement we want people to have health care. It's not a disagreement that the banks need to be restructured. Well, in my judgment, what's happened is that the president and the White House have good ideas, but when the organs of government, like the Congress and all the, the cabinet agencies, start writing laws, they write the laws that they used to think were good in 1980, mm -hmm. and they have forgotten that the world is going forward from 2010. This is a really difficult issue because it gets political, it, 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 it gets personal, and so we're very frustrated. So let me give you an example. So, uh, just one example. So this financial regulatory bill that was, that was just written, okay? Um, I don't know how many of you know this. The bill is 2,400 pages long. There are a thousand regulations. Now, okay, we needed some controls. I, nobody disagrees. We work with the administration on those things. But when the staffs and the bureaucracies and the vested interests got a hold of it, there's, a, there's going to be 150 proceedings that won't get resolved for another two or three years. So the business community is really concerned about the embedded costs that are getting put into doing business in the U.S. that are not necessary. Mm -hmm. So am I criticizing the president? No. But the organs of government need a little adult supervision on this issue so we can fix this, okay? And, and I've, told it, I've told this to the White House, so it's not that we don't, and we get into these discussions. And I, we have examples after examples. But uh, is there a head in the right place? Sure, I mean, we, we want to help fix that. Now, last thing, the, so why is there so much, um, if you look at the economy, last point, the macro numbers look terrible, you know, unemployment, demand, that kind of thing. The micro numbers don't look as bad. Your company is strong, our company is strong, a lot of companies are strong. So what's happening is there's a huge resistance to deploying risk capital. Okay? And that is because of all the uncertainty that's buried inside of the, um, the economy. And I think we need, to, we need to fix that. America needs to take the lead on that. Yep. Okay? So, so I think it's a healthy debate. I think um, the business community is obligated to speak out. We become targets of the media, the press, and, you know, and the answer is so be it. You know? right. Comes with the job. Yeah, I think our employees, I, I know this. You take my company, 220,000 people, Average salary is $60,000, $65,000. Guaranteed, our company is overwhelmingly democratic, right? But when they come into town hall meetings and they talk to me about, well, what's the gap? They get it. They get it because they know we're going to create the jobs. Business is going to create the jobs in our government. So I think the issue we have to figure out is how to take the, the policies of the, the administration and operationalize them so that it creates real organic wealth for the country. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. What I'd like to do is to talk for a few minutes about what I think, uh, and Ivan's comments I think are a perfectly good step up to this point, and maybe a couple questions and, and finish up. Uh, I've been looking at what does all of this mean for all of us, and I Ivan said some sort of amazing things. He said that basically by roughly the end of this year, 32 cities, which you're going to give me the precise list fairly right. soon, right. are going to have 10 megabits as you guys are walking around, and all you need to do is buy a, 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 new, uh, a new card for your computer or a new iPad or what have you. Uh, and this is a phenomenal achievement on their part. And the neat thing is it's good business for them. Lower costs, 
better use of capital and so forth. So it's a win-win. Absolutely. And this is what technology means. So what, what's the bigger picture? And I've been thinking about that for a while. And, and uh, let me offer you a model, uh, which I'm going to call sort of augmented humanity, for lack of a better term. The notion that people are good at some set of things, and computers are good at some things of things. And we're now actually getting to the point where computers will be very good at the things that we're no good at, and we're very good at the things that they're no good at. And it's the sum of the two, when we interact with each other, that very, very interesting things are going to have, making us all sort of smarter and quicker. And think of these computers, and I mean this in the broadest sense of computing, as a new set of di digital senses. And we've always been defined by our use of tools, right, as, a, as, a com as, a, as, a, as citizens, right, as humans. So let me offer you a basic theory that, I'll call it the Google happiness theory, the computers are there to serve us, not the other way around. And I know this is a shock, but the fact of the matter is computers are supposed to just work, right? And all that fiddling that you do, right, we really need to get to the point where they just know what to do. Um, and, and from my perspective, Google equals search becomes Google equals information that you need to know, information that, that makes your life better. And information here means more than just facts, right? Entertainment, we project things, we can instrument the world in some ways that are very powerful. And so what's interesting is the combination of the vision that Ivan outlined and what Google's doing is sort of a pervasive, a pervasive model of information everywhere. And, and you know, Bill Gates talked about this a long time ago. In 1990, he called, talked about inf all the world's information at your fingertips. It's taken us 20 years to get to this point with different technologies, but it's the correct thing. What to, and think of it as what to look for, how to spend my time. Um, and what's interesting is you sit there and you go, well, isn't that kind of obvious? But think about it. There's been this explosion of data. Right? It gives you a headache. You can't figure out what to do. You're going to be better off if tools are built that can actually help you decide how to spend your time on the information that matters, because the information overload will give you a headache. Um, and at the rate at which this is going, and with his network and all the people who are publishing new information, I don't think there's any other way we're going to be able to cope. And the other thing, the other implication that it has that it has has to do with the way devices work. So a music player going forward will be connected to the cloud, because historically music players had stored music, but now they'll have not only the stored music, but they'll also have the local music as you move along. It makes sense that all of a sudden every one of them will be able to query both the local environment as well as whatever they were programmed. And search, we may be able to get to the point, and we hope to, where the query, you know, what is the weather in my hometown, the real query you were asking is, should I wear a raincoat? Or do I need to water the plants? That's what you meant. And the artificial intelligence technology that is being invented by companies like Google and others will allow us to get at least somewhere to that point, knowing a little bit more about you again with your permission. Um, so what's happening is the tech underlying technology trends, which again you outlined so well, are fundamentally about mobile first. I will tell you that the smartest and most capable engineers in the world are now working on these powerful devices. And by the way, when you get your LTE network done, can you imagine how exciting it is to have 10 megabits reliably to these both tablets, uh, phones, tablets and phones to start with, and then desktops eventually. Lots and lots of telcos, by the way, Ivan, will be giving out free devices because it'll make sense. They'll sign up for contracts. And you'll actually be able to change the entire computing model so people can go to your store or you know, what have you, get this thing in, it just works. Uh, the network computing number uh, things, which again, you've outlined, is really phenomenal, the scale at which it and it has all sorts of implications. Um, if your children are awake, they're probably online. It's a frightening thought. Um, this technology is to the point where we can stream live video now to pretty much any device in most of the Western world. We, we've worked through the complexity and the pricing and the other issues through good engineering that people have done. And more importantly, at the, in the back, we have these supercomputers. Google, Google builds them, others do this as well. So an example would be last week we did a demonstration of the following. Picked up your Nexus One Android phone. Somebody spoke to it in English, and then the answer came back in German. Now, I have talked to 20 years that this would be possible. Now, technically, how did this work? Well, the phone simply collects your voice, digitizes it, sends it to the servers, which are somewhere in the cloud, probably not in the country, somewhere else. That voice is, is turned into text. The text is translated into the other language, in this case, English to German. Um, the, and then the answer comes back in German. It's converted back into the other language, goes to text, and so forth. That's done by a 1,000 computers that you never knew were doing it. And it's done in less than a half a second, which we view as a very long time. To me, that is the ultimate statement of something that people can't do, that computers will be able to do en masse. And there are many, many such examples. 
So if you think about it, our goal is to let people understand things very, very quickly and understand them, just be fast. In Google Instant, which people here are well aware of, why do we do that? It's faster. It ultimately leads to more queries, we think, but we fundamentally know that you get your answer just that much faster, and you go, now oh, come on, are you telling me that it's that much faster because I didn't have to type as many characters? Yeah, yeah, that, that extra typing took time. And when you've got a billion people, you add up all that extra typing, and it's a lot of people's time, and time, time, people, time, time matters. So what I want is information that is both accurate and timely, fast and easy to consume, and across all the devices in a uniform way. And we're building all of that technology. The technical aspects are personalization, AI sharing, local information, identity, deep indexing, ad system targeting, automatic translation, voice and photo recognition. We have all sorts of platform plays, which you've heard about, uh, et cetera. And we're thinking a lot about what does this mean. So let me end my, my hopefully brief comments by talking about, well, first place, I, before I finish that, I want to say this does not come at, without a cost. And Google, I think, today uh, is seen very much as a disruptor. Uh, we're not exactly excited about that, but the fact of the matter, it is, it is true. We're a disruptor fundamentally because we, uh, we do things that are technologically challenging, that really do change, uh, change assumptions. We do them at scale um, in the same way that, that you do them at scale, which I think is an important aspect. It's hard to do things at scale. Um, and the third is that we play in the information markets and people have a lot of opinions about information um, and people disagree over information and people, and people fight over what the rules are about that. So if I were to give you a sort of new view of the future, I would offer some things. You're never lost. It's interesting. Have you been lost recently? Not if you have one of these digital devices. You're never lost. It's very strange. I used to get lost. I never get lost anymore. We can position you down to the foot, even eventually the inch. Your car should be self-driving. It's clearly going to drive better than you, you are. Now, you'll want to have a button to disconnect it if there's a softer bug. But if you think about it, cars kill 30,000 people a year. It's a pretty serious issue, especially when you're drunk. Right? Wouldn't it be better if the car just drove and it had a button take me home because I'm not really quite sure where I am? Um, I'm not trying to be joke about something very serious, but the fact of the matter is it's crazy that we let humans drive these dangerous vehicles. Computers should do it. We have the technology to do that. It's clearly coming in, certainly in our lifetimes. And this explosion of real-time telemetry and data feeds has a lot of implications. Um, you and your friends know where you are. So does the government, by the way, which is a separate discussion. Um, Google Earth, Google Maps, all of that. People who love the Earth, which I hope is all of us, can love it even more. You can find out what's really going on. As I said, all the world's information is at your fingertips. Everybody speaks your language. You can know what people are doing, thinking, feeling, and people can remember. And, and this explosion in real-time information is, in fact, a search problem, which, of course, is what we're good at. But the question that we want to ask is, what exactly among all of this incredible amount of information that we're getting uh, should I pay attention to right now? Now, you're never lonely or bored. If you're lonely, you have this device that will connect you to your friends. And if you're bored, you have this infinite amount of information learning. It's like going to a bookstore and realizing you can never read all the books except it's so much more infinitely large, larger than a bookstore. And you know, television, because of things like Google, Google TV, and um, you guys are looking at this, all, everybody else is trying to figure out what to do about this merger of television and the internet, lots of very interesting ideas. Um, it's interesting that television has largely been replaced by the internet as the world's greatest time waster. What do you think people are doing on the internet? They're wasting their time just like they did on television. Right? So we're proud to be part of that, because we, you know, but it's fundamentally happening. And trust me, there's a lot more to waste your time about. Um, entertainment of games and, and uh, movies and short videos is ubiquitous. We suggest the new, next video. I was shocked that YouTube has more than 2 billion plays a day, 24 hours of YouTube videos uploaded every minute. I mean, this is very disturbing. Think about the amount of time that we're consuming. Um, and of course, that number is growing quite ra rapidly. Your friends are always around you. you know, you're, they're always online. There's always somebody for you to speak with. Your friends make Google better, right? Because the computer learns. The computer is better because the humans teach it in the same way that the humans are better because the computer remembers. Um, and what I like about this, and it's true of the things you talked about, is that this is not about the elite. When I was growing up, the information markets were fundamentally about the elite. A small group of people who had a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of control. These technologies are fundamentally democratic, and I mean that in the broadest possible sense of, of access. Um, there are roughly 800 million smartphones on the order of. 
uh, 1 billion smartphones plus and coming fairly quickly. Your numbers would say, if I do it in my head, even faster, and I, I want you to be right. Uh, and of course, connected to the supercomputer. Um, and this notion of these new applications, and I think the iPad has really shown, shown us a very good model. These applications that just work, I think, show us a path for all these new devices. And of course, that'll be true on everybody else's way. So, so ultimately, what happens is computers become, they do what we're not good at. They make lists, they remember everything, and they keep memories of what we do. And what we do is we help you take that information and try to figure out what you want to do. And in this model, again, this is all with your permission and so forth, we can really help you live a much fuller life. And you really can both enjoy yourself and, and feel like you are really at the center of the, center of the world. Uh, what I like about this is that we can suggest where you sh should go for dinner. We can even suggest what you should worry about. There's lots of information that we have now. So the context for this, just to finish, is for you to think about uh, computers and humans working together to solve problems that neither can solve alone, which I think is the most, most profound way of saying it. And it's not about not doing evil, it's about being committed to doing good, right? That using this technology to, in fact, improve the lot of everybody. Um, there's a quote from William Gibson in the New York Times last week. Google has made of us a sort of coral reef of human minds and their products, the stuff of poetry, I thought. Um, people want more time for their, for their friends, for their lives, and so forth, and I think we can make a significant contribution to that if we get the products right. Um, so thank you, and I think thank you, th thank you all for, for that. Um, what I wanted to do just to, f to, to finish is to say thank you to the teams that put this event together, Lorraine and her whole team. Could we have a round of applause for all of them? <laughs> um, based, on, based on the hallway feedback, uh, the feedback from dinner last night, this tone of optimism, with the exception of a number of our friendly economists, um, all work very well. I think the call to action about education, let's just say the unique humor of Ted Turner, uh, the sum of all of this, I think, was an extraordinary event. I think the sense, the feedback from you all is that we should do this again, and so I'm looking forward to do th doing this in the future. Are there comments or questions for Ivan and me for a few minutes before we, we finish up? We have a, a few minutes. Yes, go ahead. Ah, the iPhone on Verizon question, Ivan. <laughs> When will you have the iPhone on Verizon? He want, he's a Verizon user and he cannot have an iPhone. Yeah. So what I would say is this. I think that um, it shouldn't surprise anybody to think that um, all the manufacturers are gearing themselves up to develop a 4G smartphone. Um, that, that, you know, I think that's where I would be on it. Um, anything else that Apple does, you know, they don't tell anybody. So I, I think at this point, though, we're excited that we'll have um, a full range of devices on 4G. Now, but the point I would make, though, is that um, I think this network is not conducive to just doing what you always did. I think people will have to make a quantum leap and find brand new applications for it. So um, what I'm thinking is Google, uh, you're going to find Motorola, you're going to find all these companies are going to make um, Apple work um, at their game uh, just as hard, so I, I think I'm, I'm excited about it. So I think 4G is going to break that that logjam that you talked about. And, and I would I, I, let me just also answer a question you didn't ask. I think the competition that you're seeing now is phenomenally good, because the competition ultimately produces multiple winners, because it's creating this very, very, very large market, and the applications people are coming, and the model that I'm talking about will get built out and proven. He will be forced to, in fact, he chooses to put massive amount of capital into building up the infrastructure. We'll work very hard to respond to the Apple product line with our own, and you know it's good for consumers. Go ahead. Actually, that was a great lead into the question that I had. Uh, at lunch, you um, apparently at a press briefing were talking about competition in the U.S. wireless market as being um, uh, very, very competitive, and it's. It was striking to me because I was talking to some people from Finland recently who were talking about how in their country when somebody doesn't have access to, like they can't get cell reception in their attic, that they called up the phone company and the companies were competing to provide that service. In America we don't have that because of the differences as you were talking about with CDMA versus um, GSM. And I think it's actually to the detriment of 
particularly your company, because you do have the best network and the best coverage. Um, and so I'm wondering, with the transition to 4G, and you were talking about standards related to that, is, is that also going to allow us to have better freedom to move between networks, to make decisions based on um, you know, which network is providing us with the best service? Like, even on a day-to-day -day basis or those sorts of things, is that, is that part of the promise of 4G? Yeah, the the um, 4G standard uh, will allow for device manufacturers to uh, design to a common standard. So all you have to do is take a SIM card out like you do in Europe, and you'll be able to move from carrier to carrier. Okay, so I think that's the, that would be the plan, that you could see how it would work out. But it also sounds like you'll be first with the broad well, LTE it, rollout, yeah. and so... Well, that's true. And then the other point is that the frequencies on which 4G operates is in the lower bands, and therefore it penetrates walls a little bit better. So you'll see in-building coverage instantly a lot better, and then we'll work on deploying the other kinds of devices you need to deploy to make in-building coverage. And and, you know, amazing, we've come from a point in time where uh, people now expect the phone to work in the fifth basement, uh, four well, wells. Well, 25% of, of them yeah. don't have line, yeah, lines right, anymore. Exactly. So the answer is it's a good, it's a good opportunity for us. I, I don't view that as a problem. It's something we, we need to do. And rem you'll remember that you competed with us for $4 billion for the 700 megahertz spectrum. Remember that fight? That wasn't a fight. Yes. Well, you won. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. um. You, you were never going to buy that. <laughs> does, uh, does 4G make um, sort of land-based high bandwidth connectivity obsolete, you know, even Fios as well as other forms of, of high bandwidth connectivity, or, or do, do you sort of foresee that people for whom connectivity is really important so, will have both? So here's the way we would look at that. I think that Eric's right. For mobility, they'll get you 10 megabits to your person or to your device. We still think there'll be a huge market for wide area, you know, wide area uh, Wi-Fi networks or even fiber optic networks for that 100 megabit applications, particularly for commercial and television. So I think what you'll find is the market will segment, but we think there's, there's still a, a lot of room for 100 megabits to a fixed location to do video conferencing and things like that. Actually, you know, um, if you don't mind, this is, this is kind of right up your alley. So last week was the 44th anniversary of Star Trek, right? You all knew that. I knew you did. And um, so if you think of all the things that Star Trek has done, it's all come true. There's only two things left, right? Holographic uh, capabilities, which we're now starting to play with, yeah. and then teleporting, right? So we're okay. going to beam Eric all over the world. <laughs> so you now have... You now have all these engineers working on quantum physics and how to take photons and move them from here to there. So you so, first, Ivan. So no, we're going to do this. So, so, so you're going to need, you're going to need 100 megabit networks into into fixed locations to teleport Eric all over the planet. You're going to need to do that. Right. Um, do you anticipate that power users should be sort of in their own class with not on an all-you-can-eat plan for for data? Sort of, I mean, a 30 megabit, if, I, if I'm, you know, if I watch videos 24 hours a day in HD and I overtax the network, should I sort of not yeah. be allowed to do that? This is a user? highly charged question, I could tell. <laughs> um, here's what I would say. I think there should be bundles and tiers. I don't think this should be, we don't think this should be, Eric thinks everything should be free. We don't come from that class. But I think there's, there shouldn't be some linear model. Uh, I don't think that's right. So there should be natural bundles. and if. You happen to use a, a 900 megabits a month, you might pay something for that bundle as opposed to somebody who might only use 10 or 15 megabits a month. So the market will get that right. But w we do believe there needs to be some tiering of pricing. One of the fundamental things to remember is that there's essentially infinite bandwidth in a strand of fiber, and there's very much not infinite bandwidth in the current wireless allocation. And so there are, there are in fact, fundamental differences in the technology, and those will be true for a long time. Go ahead. So a big part of my wife's job was uh, calling up various cell phone providers every month and going through the stacks and stacks of bills where each line that her company dealt with was on a different plan. And it seems like, uh, I think she actually said that Verizon was one of the better companies to deal with. But the, the sense that I've gotten dealing with a lot of the cell phone companies is the billing model works a lot like the banks do, where they have kind of convoluted rules that, that maximize their profits and make it completely impossible to, under, to predict what's going to happen with billing. Do you think that there's hope for 
having something where you can walk up to the person and say, what will my bottom line price be and know that that's what you're going to pay every month? Yeah, now, if I may answer that, but, but I, I want to be, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. That's a rich person's view of the world because the average person is very price sensitive. And so what we have found, what we have found in, in, the, in the process, yes, we're complicated and we should simplify it, I guarantee that. I, so I take that comment. But the whole issue of bringing everything down to a bottom line, one price, it's not the way people work. It's not the way stereo components got sold. It's not the way almost anything is. So the struggle we have is how you mass customize you give people enough information. Have we gone overboard? Sure. But I, so I think the issue of thinking about Nirvana being, we're going to simplify it all into one price and it's going to be $69.99 a month. The day you do that, people are going to say, itemize the bill for me. And this is what the market does. So I think this is a sort of a, a burden we have, we have to figure out. Um, but so well, I, particularly for the, poor, for the poorer people where that extra $15 charge or $30 charge because their kid was using tax Which is 80% of the market. Pushes them over there into overdraft right. fees now that they get charged. Oh, no question. So the things we could do better, there's no question. But, but I, my comment, though, is what we're trying to figure out is how to give the customer as much control over how much information they want as opposed to us itemizing everything. Now, of course, in our case, not to complain, but you have state taxes, you got local taxes, so we're the greatest tax collector ever, so you have to itemize a lot of, a lot of those things. This has been a, a, this is a driving problem in our industry for a long time. Never quite ever get this right. We're getting better at it. We just came out with our newest, newest, 100th version of the newest bill, and so we, we keep trying to work this. So you, your comment's well taken, but I yeah, just- Thank you for trying. I, I wouldn't want you to oversimplify it to think it really gets down to one price. Go ahead. It doesn't work. Thank you. So um, I know you said that with 4G, of course, people would have SIM cards as they have with GSM, but I want to ask you about something bolder, which is moving the United States away from the subsidy lock model, as overseas they have done in a number of countries. And T-Mobile in the United States will let you have your phone for $20 a month less if you bring your own Nexus One that you bought directly, for example, into them. Uh, do you see Verizon and other American carriers moving away from subsidy lock and allowing a lot more flexibility in how people buy handsets and yeah. how they move from customer until you win the customer every month with good service rather than a contract? Right. So I guess you don't have an opinion about this, I guess. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So, I'm open to all views. Yeah. Can, can but, he has, but he has an opinion. Yeah. Can I offer a couple of facts as, mm -hmm. as an answer to that? So average usage in Europe of cell phones, right? is um, about uh, 200 minutes a month. Here it's 900 minutes a month. So the model that says you bring your own device has actually created a lot less utility out of the network and the service. The issue in the States has been, because of the very question the gentleman there just asked, that the entry barriers for people to buy the service were such that if we didn't subsidize the handset, we couldn't penetrate the market. Now, what we, what we would like to do is move more to the next generation of devices to be more like the PC. So you buy your own, you get your connection. What we have to make sure, though, is we don't suppress demand because we create an entry price that's so high that people can't make it. That's why you have contracts. Now, people don't like contracts, but it's, it has allowed us to penetrate the market with more devices. So we have, in data, in the US, higher penetration of data, higher penetration of usage than almost anywhere on the planet, perhaps except Japan. Now, so the issue is we need to migrate. Now, I think what you'll find us trying to do is testing, as we roll out 4G, different classes of devices to see what those subsidy levels might be and where we need to go with them. So you, you, your point's not wrong, and, and we got it, but it's not as simple as giving the market a cold turkey shower and saying from now on out, you're gonna spend a, a tablet is going to cost five or six hundred dollars, and Eric will be the first one to call me and say, "We'll give it away." Absolutely, you should right. be giving it away. We had this conversation. Right, exactly. And and the answer to that is, it's a hard issue when you spent thirty or forty billion dollars. Think of all the network. money that you can yeah, make. You, know. you send this thing. There's all this right. downstream revenue. You know, you upsell. Right. We so had this conversation. Yeah, we did. And because you make all the money, we don't. You know, What's wrong with this? The answer is. We got it. Checks in the mail, Eric. We got it. Okay, I hope that the answer is we're sensitive to your point. We've got to transition to it and get there in a way that balances the business model needs of 
By the, the way, I hope I wasn't saying that you have to get rid of subsidies, but just that T-Mobile's model, which allows both to exist, I think is, is a good way to migrate. So, thanks. T-Mobile's not us. Right. The, uh, I want to thank everybody again. Thank you, Ivan, for everything you've done. We depend on you and everybody else. You really did make it possible for us to actually be here and talk, talk and so forth and so on. And the future is really enabled by this. I think, Nikesh, maybe it's time for us to get off the stage and turn this whole event off to you. Over well, to I just want to say thank you very much, Ivan. Thank, thank you, you, Eric. Let's have a round of applause for the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you.